This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs the Playbook, and I'm excited because I have an old and a new friend here, Steve Sims. He is the founder, CEO of Bluefish. He's also an author. He's a consultant. He speaks around the world, uh, you know, a real entrepreneur. And when I say that, that's because your background isn't from Harvard as a literature major. <laughs> and in fact, you weren't even born in America. You didn't work in America. You honestly were a bricklayer. Yeah, yeah. Left school at the age of 15. Like most entrepreneurs, kind of um, didn't know what I was going to do. So I bounced off the walls and being big and ugly, I you know got in trouble in East London because that's all that existed in East London was trouble. Um, and uh, yeah, I started being a bricklayer. And literally, I remember being 15, 16 years old thinking, is this it? Is, really? Is this my life? And it was uh, kind of like goodwill hunting, right? You, yeah, <laughs> you're was, a bad David. <laughs> well, it, it even when uh, yeah, just not as good looking. <laughs> it even went worse than that because I remember going, and this was a real epiphany moment. And I can even smell the air as I tell you the story. I went onto my building site one day. My dad was there, my uncle, my cousins, and right at the end of the uh, the, the the plank, the lineup, was my granddad. I saw my entire family tree on one piece of scaffolding. And I went down to my granddad, like a you know silly little kid. And I went down to him at tea break, and I went, Granddad, did you expect to be doing this all your life? And he's like 80 years old, and no one expects to be working at 80. Yeah. And uh, he didn't even kind of look at me. He just turned around to me, and he said, if you don't quit today, you'll be me tomorrow. Whoa. And I thought, well, and I walked up to my dad, and, uh, you know, I'm a big Irish lad, and my dad's a big Irish lad. And I went, Dad, I've got to quit. He said, what do you mean? I said, I've got to quit. And I just knew... As an entrepreneur, I didn't know I was an entrepreneur at the time. I just knew this wasn't it. And if I didn't if I didn't start taking some chances, I was going to be granddad. So he didn't realize, and he died. Never really got the chance to tell him that story and tell him what an impact he had on my, my future. The good, the bad, and the ugly, but definitely my future. Well, it seems so interesting because a lot of times there's these poignant moments. And for you, in that 15 to 16 range, you also met your wife. I did, I did, yeah. <laughs> We've been together forever, and she's my, she's my rock, she's my best friend, she's my everything. So yeah, I got very lucky early. I think that's important because a lot of people think being an entrepreneur means being alone. You know, that you have to do it. You can't take and and I'm yeah. my my wife's my savior. I met her when I was nine years old. Unfortunately for me, she hated me when I was little. It took me a little longer until <laughs> she would marry me, but uh, I would not be the double success that I am and. In my life, because I've had these two unbelievable runs in my life, and I only credit one person, that person who, you know, people say your your wife, you know, stands behind me. I mean, mine's been in front of me, pulling me, showing oh, me where hell to yeah. go. The, the, my wife, and I don't want anyone out there kind of like thinking, my God, it's for me to be successful, I've got to be married. No, that's no. That's not the case. Yeah, uh, exactly. My wife is the one that's, you know, she's five foot five and the scariest thing on the planet. You know, she <laughs> terrifies me. But she's the one that, that sits there. And drinks her coffee and turns around and says, you're really doing that? And it's just those little words. You start going, why? Why shouldn't I? And she'd be like, just saying. And then, it's the, then you start thinking. Her so she's the one that, yeah, you. She's the one that challenges you. Because like all entrepreneurs, if you turn around to an entrepreneur and go, oh, you can't do that. You know they're going to put double speed in doing it. Of course. Just and, like an athlete. Yeah. And yeah. that's usually double speed in running off the cliff um, <laughs> and getting it wrong. So she's the one there that actually understands how to control how to talk you down, how to manipulate, for want of a better word, yeah. to do the best. That's and uh, so, yes, yeah, so they're very powerful. So you're sitting there now saying, I quit. What do you do? Oh. Right? You have no education. You're young yeah. and you're a bricklayer. So like, how do you end up being a stockbroker? Uh, yeah, that didn't last long. Um, yeah. I was um, So I was on the train in London because you know I tried doing loads of different things. And every now and then to get some money, went back to Brick Lane because that's what I'd known from the age of 12. Yeah. Um, and I was on the, uh, on the train one day, and this guy from school uh, was a stockbroker. And he recognized me from school. And of course, you know, he was older, I was older. You know, we were still in our late teens, but I didn't recognize him, but he recognized me. And apparently, I had stopped him getting a thumping at school. So he <laughs> came over and was like, oh, what are you doing? And, and then he told me that um, they were taking these stockbro uh, stockbrokers over to Hong Kong. And you should come in and try and get an internship for the London division. So I went in there and I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, I want it. And this was the age of Gecko and Ferraris <laughs> right. and cell phones yeah, on greed. suitcases. And, you know, there was me getting wet every day on a, on a building site. I wanted that life, you know. 
So I went in, applied for the job, which meant sitting in a room full of about 200 other uh, applicants because they were doing this mass employment thing. The next conference room, they were talking to all of the brokers that they were transferring to Hong Kong that was going to make space for this new wave of stockbroker. I'd already realized that I didn't even know how to add up two and two without help. So <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to get the job. So I sat in the other room and just listened to how these guys were going to be in Wan Chai and they were going to be doing this and all the terminology I didn't understand. And this was back in the, in the 90s, <laughs> so in the early 90s. I walked up to the girl at the back of the room and I said, look, I'm not getting all my mail. Do you have my address, right? And she said, oh, uh, let me check. What's your name? Steve Sims. Of course, she's looking through this flip chart. I don't even exist. I'm not even in the system. So she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so she writes it down. I gave her my address. I actually got the package to go to Hong Kong. I was actually recruited with the existing <laughs> senior stockbrokers. So I turned <laughs> up on the Saturday with them, got drunk, partied on the, on the Sunday night. Monday did orientation, I was fired on the Tuesday. They realized I had squeaked through somehow. <laughs> and now I'm in a foreign country, no friends. I thought no future, but I had broken the chain. I had got away from the... I couldn't be a bricklayer in Hong Kong. You know, I couldn't. Yeah. So I'd broke the mold. I'd, I'd gone through the glass seat. It was shattered. Um, so I knew that if I failed... Everyone would be like, well, what do you expect? You were a brick lad from London. What were you trying to do? You knew you couldn't do that. I had that to fall on, okay? But if I was successful, that was all me. And that was the challenge I was willing to take. And that's a really important point because through your book, through your speaking, through your consulting, you're the type of person from the day that I met you that does – doesn't put faith in what other people want for you. You don't put faith in what, in what other people think. Because I see as an entrepreneur, the greatest success in your power, your superpower, is to be able to look down the lineage from your brothers to your uncles to your dad to your grandpa and say, instead of I'm going to be just like them, to somehow break the chain. And this happens whether, and you do consulting and executive coaching and, and speaking and inspirational speaking to tell people, you know, just because four generations have done this, alcoholism, gambling, losing their money, mm -hmm. right? Wh whatever these historical, I believe it's an unconscious competency, a genetics, a quantum frequency that you're carrying, but you have the power to break the chain. 100%. What do you think and what do you teach gives you... The, the best chance or, or, or perspective to break the chain. What do you tell people to motivate them to break that chain? Do you know, it's, it's, it's funny uh, because I've tried analyzing how I actually do it. Um, and I suppose it's one of those things that once you know the secret sauce, you know, you may, you may ruin the, the, the recipe. <laughs> one thing I think I'm responsible for is giving people permission. Because when they see a uneducated bricklayer, and it's funny, you joked about Harvard and, you know, it, it was a fact. But I've lectured at Harvard twice. Right. I knew that. So being in Harvard and sitting in front of people that are leaving Harvard with half a million dollars worth of debt, and I'm actually being paid to lecture to them, I do find funny. <laughs> I too. think what I've done is I've granted people permission to do something different. I've granted people permission to do the, well, what if? Not, well, just because. There's a lot of people say, well, I did that just because it's always been done. Well, because the family, there's that because moment. And I'm there to go, hey, you don't need to be that. Tomorrow's your destiny. Tomorrow's your, your future. Today's where you make it happen. Let's try doing something different. And I always wanted to do something different because it's like the elastic band theory. If you do something different, you never go back. Even when you fail, and a lot of people are scared of failing, my greatest strength, my greatest growth, my greatest uh, empowerment has come from my biggest failings. And so you use those as your, uh, your education. Yes, I class myself as growing up uneducated. Now I'm incredibly educated because I have failed so much, tried so many things, but as a true entrepreneur, have allowed it to refine me, not define me. I love that. I just used that today as a posting <laughs> to refine and define. It's so funny because we share a friend who's one of my mentors, Greg Reed. Oh, yeah. And phenomenal person. And I remember when we first met, you know, I asked him specifically, I'm like, you know, what, what's the magic? 
you know, in this guy, right? And he literally said, because he's able to take and put faith, you know, and vote for what he wanted that other people couldn't even imagine, right? That you were able to basically manifest without any fear and get out of your own way to do that. Fear is a big component mm. uh, for, for everything. And, and, you know, it searches. That's why I think our wives are so powerful because yeah. the, instead of pressing us to fear, which brings anger and frustration, and we go down that long trajectory of ego trying to prove our wives wrong, the need to be right, they actually manipulate us into thinking it was our own idea. <laughs> yeah, they're very good at that. And uh, they, they will even sometimes applause until you suddenly realize you were hoodwinked. Right. So, yeah. it's, it's, and you realize this was your idea all along, but they just nod and smile. Yeah, it's so blessed. When you're dealing with entrepreneurs and you've built this business, it's a luxury concierge yep. business. It really didn't exist before no, you, didn't. you materialized it. You know, talk us through how that materialization, what other people call manifestation, you know, I call it materialization because I believe everything already exists. You're just taking your imagination and materializing it with what you monetize and yeah. you built a brand on. What process does it take to do that, to materialize something from possibility to probability to reality? I think people need to know why. I think why is probably the most understated word out there. I use why so much. Yeah. And I remember when I was in Hong Kong, I never had any money. Um, I had to get a job. Being big and ugly, working on the door was an obvious choice. So I worked on the door. From that pedestal, from that viewpoint of humanity, going out for the night to celebrate, you know, a girls' night out, a first date, a big deal, you know, whatever it was, I was able to look at these people. And the first thing that I did, keeping it very simple, was I thought to myself, who do I want to be? You know, and I would see a couple of guys turn up. They've got a couple of beers in them. You know, they just want to go inside and have another couple of beers and start a fight. I, <laughs> did, I didn't want to be them. Then you'd see the guys that were going out celebrating a deal where they'd worked hard and they'd managed to celebrate. And they were all being courteous to each other, courteous to the valet people, courteous to the bar staff. And I thought, I want to be them. So when I was working on the door, I literally used to play the game. The game. I want to be them. I don't want to be them. I want to be. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, okay. Now I know who I want to be, I want to talk to them. So I had to give them a reason to talk to me. So being on the door, you always knew what clubs were coming out. You know, I would be asked to be on the door for premieres, for jewellery openings, for fashion shows. I could now go to these people and go, hey, you like the good life. I know I have a couple of events coming up. Do you want, do you want me to get you in? I'll see what I can do. And then I would say to them, and I, I learned early on, if they don't pay, they don't pay attention. You say to someone, hey, I've got two free tickets for you, be at seven o'clock. They may not show. You say I got two tickets at seven o'clock, it's 500 bucks each. I'll be there, okay, because they paid. Right. So very early on, I would say, hey, I can get you in, it's 500 bucks each. And that went from 500 to charging five grand for my tickets for my parties. Very soon, and the only reason I was doing this was to get a group of people that actually I wanted to be. And the old saying about you are the combination of the people you know, I looked at all of my broadcast biker friends and thought, I don't want to be in this ring. Right. You know? It's like you looked at your dad, your grandpa, your uncle. I your looked to my friends. They were good people. Yeah. Oh, definitely. You know, no one said anything about But they weren't my future. Right. Okay. It and wasn't your frequency. That's a beautiful way of putting it. They weren't going to help me get to where I needed to be because they were content on where they were. Okay. And for a lot of people, that's fine, but not for me. So I needed to stretch. I needed to push myself out, make new friends. And you try making friends with someone that looks good and you suddenly realize that, that you know everything's rented and that and so you go, ah, <laughs> I made a mistake. It teaches you more about how to recognize the authenticity and the transparency in people. So my early days of setting up this party promotion, uh, this wish fulfillment guide, the man that can, there was no idea of building an industry. The sole reason for doing it was to get a Rolodex of highly successful people that I wanted to be. That was the sole reason. And I actually, huh, and it's, it's, it's funny now to look back, I actually thought to myself, one day I'm going to get a job with these people. I'm going to impress them so much that they're going to go, hey, Steve, sell jets for me or sell yachts for me. <laughs> I didn't realize I was inventing a concierge industry. I had no idea until quite simply 10, 15 years into it. And you, and you built that. Last question, you know, we both, I, I, when I would, think of us we have so many similar personalities i always say one of my best attributes is i'm one of the 
world's greatest losers. And people are like, what are you oh, talking about? I'm one. like, I am a great loser. I, because number one, I handle loss mm-hmm. really, really well, but also I learn from it, yeah. which I think, you know, and I can, your, all your stories lend to, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a great loser here. That, yeah. You know, I, I want to get to the last question because I'm rare, rarely around. And one of the things that we kind of bonded on when we met is we both deal with the highest frequency people. The who's who, and there's something special about a Hall of Famer, about a billionaire. Yes. There, there's something special. There's a frequency, and I wanted the same as you. Yep. I grew up looking up at the hill, going, "I'm as good as them," right? I, I don't have my six kids, single mom. She's working two jobs, but I know I'm. I can outwork them. I'm just as smart as them. I'm going to prove it. And then I realized, as I did, like you, surrounded myself that they were at a different frequency, and that I had to learn that frequency. What's the greatest lesson? with all the greatest losers that you and I are, but what's the greatest lesson that you learned as an aggregate watching all those super successful, fulfilled, purposeful, passionate people, or even the, the ones that weren't, but what's that one lesson that you would like to carry forward and, and help people with? I want to be as, art- as articulate as you in this explanation. <laughs> so um, I think it was the immunity to the giggles now here's a funny thing we're in a society now where we like to laugh at people for falling over we make tv shows out of it there's vines on it there's there's instagram postings if someone walks into a wall hey hope i got that on video and it's gonna it's gonna (laughs) go viral we love laughing at people we love laughing at successful people praying that they're gonna fail we love to lift them up and then tear them down every week you hear something about tesla going bankrupt spacex and never get off the ground nasa used to laugh at spacex now it's his biggest client. The one thing I noticed in the standard of people that I work with is they don't care about you giggling. And I'm going to quote Elon Musk uh, from SpaceX. We're walking through SpaceX. I had about 10 people with me. One of the guys was gagging to try and strike up a conversation with Elon. He came out with the dumbest question in the world, but he still came out with it. He asked Elon, um, you know, oh, you know, you, you got NASA, you know, and, and, and I remember when they, they didn't want to work with you and they, they laughed at the space. How do you feel about that? Okay. Elon didn't even look at him, just turned around and said, they'll always laugh before they applaud. And the people that I work with are all serial failures, whether it be Jean-Paul de Jouria, whether it be um, yeah. Elon Musk, whether it be Richard Branson, they're all serial failures, but they have no care completely immune to you giggling from your armchair by accomplishing nothing they look at all of those things they failed at and go there's my education there's my degree in that loss there now how can i make sure that never happens again and elon musk's rocket do you remember when it was the the reusable fuel cells yeah how many times did it try to land on the platform fall over explode it was almost nightly news wasn't it yeah when was the last time you saw it you haven't why bloody thing works now you know, Changing now that it works, no one cares. Now he keeps doing it every day, won't even make the, the 10 o'clock news. Well, I will tell you the theme of this show, and there is extraordinary value. If you don't go back and listen to this gold, you're making a huge mistake because the gold of understanding people will always laugh before they applaud is just unbelievable and breaking the chain. Steve, man, it's so nice. I love this show because I get to know people even better. <laughs> uh, you are a superstar, an entrepreneur, author, f- philanthropist. I forgot that one too as well, just doing so much for charity as I know, uh, but also an incredible inspirational speaker. I think you Cheers, can get man. some depth on what Steve's talking about. And in, uh, I may have to even call you afterwards, ask a few more questions because you are my kind of guy and I certainly appreciate it. Steve Sims with Bluefish, he is truly a renaissance man for the 2019 one of my favorite podcasts yet thank you so much for coming on this is dave Meltzer with the playbook that was gold man good